The webinar will begin in just a moment. Hello to everyone joining the group. The webinar will begin in just a moment. Thank you for joining us today from across the country. We know that our country and our industry are facing an unprecedented crisis. The restaurant and food service industries have been impacted by COVID-19 in so many ways. Restaurants are on restricted service or closed. Many of our colleagues are facing unemployment and are struggling. Please know that as members of the food service industry, the ACF community is here for you. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, about one in five Americans lives with mental illness, yet only half receive treatment. In a recent study conducted by Chefs with Issues, 73% of participating chefs reported that they suffer from multiple mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. Food service workers have the highest rates of substance abuse disorders. You are not alone. Today, let's have a candid discussion about these issues. Let's meet our panelists for ACF United, Stronger Together, Healing the Mind, Body, and Spirit of Chefs. Chef Lisa Dorfman is a chef, author, and international health expert who has built a global practice consulting to Olympian, yeah. professional, and collegiate athletes for over three decades. Chef Dorfman is a nutritionist, board certified specialist in sports dietetics, board certified professional counselor, certified chef, certified culinary medicine specialist, and re has received many other accolades. She is a graduate of Miami Culinary Institute and the culinary medicine program at Tulane Medical School. And she's also the chairperson for MCI Advisory Board and the Chef Alliance Director for Slow Food Miami. Chef Dorfman has also appeared on 2020, Dateline, Good Morning America, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, ES ESPN, um, is an, and is a competitive runner and triathlete who has competed in more than 34 marathons. Chef Jeffrey Schlissel is president of the Palm Beach Chefs Association of the American Culinary Federation. He is also the founder of the Bacon Cartel, a chef-driven smoke shop that specializes in pork. He has been a presenter at ACF National Convention and has been an inspiration to many in the ACF community. Last year, Chef Slichel started Family Meal, playing tribute to Chef Anthony Bourdain and shedding the spotlight on suicide. This event has focused on the social stigma of suicide um, and he's had uh, multiple presenters um, there to speak about their stories. Chef Nina Curtis is an avid proponent of the plant-based lifestyle for the past 18 years. Nina currently serves as culinary director for Adventist Health's corporate office. She is an advocate for women's advancement in all aspects of life as well as animal rights and Nina works tirelessly to incorporate diversity, inclusion, and compassion in all that she does. She has an MBA from Pepperdine University and is also trained at the Living Light Culinary Institute, Trinity School of Natural Health, the Natural Gourmet Culinary Institute, and holds a plant-based nutrition certificate from Cornell. Chef and author Keith Saracen began his culinary career at age 14 washing dishes. As the years went on, he worked in a variety of restaurants working his way up to executive chef. Keith worked as a private chef before founding the Farmer's Dinner, a farm to table event planning company. And the Farmer's Dinner uh, concept came about by chef working with the local farms in the New England area. He wanted a way to support the local farms and has been sharing the stories um, of those local farmers. Since 2012, the Farmer's Dinner has hosted over 81 farm to table events across New England and fed more than 17,000 customers, raising over $120,000 for local farms. In 2019, Keith opened Greenleaf, a farm to table restaurant in New Hampshire, and is the founder and co-owner of Northern Comfort Hospitality. 
He also started the Facebook support group Industry United, which has been connecting food service workers from across the country who are sharing resources and advice. Um, let me see. Um, so let's get started um, with, um, with some of our questions. So uh, first I would say, um, and um, let's pose this question to uh, Chef Dorfman. Uh, what do you see as the uh, current biggest mental, physical, or spiritual issue that's facing the culinary community during this crisis time? I think during this time, it's not seeing the light of the tunnel. Like just, you know, and I, I was thinking about this question and, you know, it's like, it's like somebody having like not the best pregnancy and you have nine months to get through it. There will be, you know, an end to that pregnancy. There is light at the end of the tunnel and hopefully it won't be nine months for us. Um, and at the end of that tunnel, we'll all be eating in the end. We, we will have a profession. We will have a career. So um, I see that as the, the immediate issue right now, not, you know, the issues that affect us on a daily basis. But right now, that's where, where it's at. Absolutely. And Chef Saracen, um, I said a similar question. I know that you've been um, fielding a lot and on your Facebook page um, and experiencing a lot of this personally. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on uh, the mental and physical and spiritual issues that we're all facing. Yeah, well, uh, first, thank you to the ACF and thank you to the, all the panelists here today. Um, when I started the Industry United Forum uh, two weeks ago at this point, uh, we, you know, I just, I felt helpless. Um, I saw what I worked my entire life for uh, starting to crumble. Um, I saw my restaurant go down to a fifth of what it was. Um, it just felt helpless. And uh, that's not, we're not in an industry where we feel helpless all the time. Uh, we were used to kind of taking the bull by the horns. Um, and so when I started Industry United, one of the first things that I did is talk about mental health. Um, as bad as the economic side of this is, as bad as the health side of this is, and believe me, it is, I'm so concerned about the mental health side of this moving forward as all of us have worked our entire lives to get where we are and to watch it vanish in the blink of an eye. Um, so I think making sure that we address those issues now before, you know, you don't put out when you see the fire, that's when you start to fight the fire. You don't wait until it's taking over the entire house. And I think that's one of my biggest concerns right now. Absolutely. Well, 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 thank you. And I think we're going to dig into a lot of these um, subjects as we go through the conversation. Uh, just as a, no uh, a note to any of the viewers, feel free to use the, um, the question uh, and answer uh, feature, which is at the bottom of your screen, um, so that we can also address any of the questions that you might have as well. Um, so Chef Schlissel, um, studies have shown that um, chefs are more susceptible to developing depression um, and how do you um, think we can recognize this either in ourselves or in our colleagues in order to get them some help? You know, I, it's, I think the first thing we have to do is acknowledge that we have depression, right? I think the first thing is to, to grab hold the, the bull by the horn, as Chef said, and say, look, it, I'm depressed. I know we started doing a podcast and we were getting different Last week, we were focusing on female chefs and being in the industry and what they were about. And I remember doing a, a podcast with Lindsay and, and Thomas from the Lee Initiative. And they were frontline, you know, re the restaurant was flipped over to being a, a rescue, feed, a food rescue, and they were feeding. And I, one of the questions I asked was, how's the mental health of the people that you're delivering that food to? And they're like, we don't know. It's a great question. And it, the problem for me is, and we just had Adam, uh, Alan Maddock in from the uh, American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. And I asked that same question. If we're now supposed to be social distancing, mm -hmm. you can't think about it being as mental distancing as well. And all it takes is having that phone call and having that network, um, you know, picking the phone up and calling. A lot of times when we have a depression or we're in a state of depression, we close the blinds, we don't open the blinds, we curl up in the fetal position, we eat more, we drink more, especially chefs, we drink more, we might do more drugs. I think the acknowledgement of the waking up every morning and having that choice, that decision in the morning, do I wanna be happy or do I wanna be negative? You know, look for something, you know, take two minutes out, set your phone up and 
click a timer and write down what you're gr grateful for. And it's really hard once you've done that drill to keep your mentality or your mental state to being depressed or negative. And I think that's the key right now for us to do, especially with what's going on in our, our present COVID situation. Absolutely. Thank you for, for, for sharing that. Um, and uh, Chef Curtis, I guess with so many of our chef friends who are currently out of work, out of their kitchens, um, probably struggling, uh, what uh, have you been experiencing and what are your thoughts um, for them? I think for all of us, it's, we're in the same bucket, right? This fear, this unfelt fear. We've all said to some degree how we're the people that are strong. We're the people that show up. We're the people that can turn on the dime. Produce didn't come in. We make it happen and we make it happen in a way no one else knew it wasn't happening. So this level of uncertainty that we're experiencing and this amount of what I think fear then comes at depression, right? Because I can't control it. And we tend to be, I'll speak for myself, I like to be in control. I run a kitchen, I'm responsible for people, and I go in there knowing I know my game on most days. So colleagues of mine and myself, you know, I think what is fear? And I learned this a long time ago, false evidence appearing real. But it's real right now, it's in our face. And we really have to dig ourselves out of that potential black hole or keep ourselves out of that black hole um, not to get in. And, and I really have been telling my staff, we're not open. I'm training them remotely. We're talking you know, every other day, but I'm in contact daily. And I'm like, journal, journal what you're feeling. And then we come together and we express it in a safe, place to talk about it with no judgment. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm actually going to go around the panel um, because I think this one is important for chefs to hear what other chefs are doing. Um, I'm wondering if you could give me some examples of what you do for self-care, um, either in this time of crisis or before, and how um, we can hopefully help and touch those who might be viewing. Um, so, uh, Chef Dorfman, did you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, one of the most important things is to stay in a routine. So to have some kind of schedule, some kind of ritual, something, because, you know, as the other panelists mentioned, we feel out of control. So the one thing that we can control is, is our day right now. So getting up, doing some exercise. We know that exercise produces those natural antidepressants in our brain so that we feel better. And we also feel fitter. We feel stronger. Then you spend a couple of hours improving your craft. You know, we're never, we're never there in this profession. So uh, on our earlier webinar, I was saying I took some classes. I took a cannabis, a culinary cannabis in a course, um, you know, in the last week. Um, but there are ways to grow, um, maybe organize. I organize my, my recipes. Um, there's different things that you could do pertaining to making yourself better within, within you know, your world of food. Um, and then that connective piece. I think Jeffrey was saying that connecting to others is so critical because it's, it's one of the first signs when we disconnect, when we pull down the blinds and we don't speak to others. Um, I could always tell when somebody's not doing well when they say they're doing fine. And my very first, when I became a licensed psychotherapist back in the day, um, my very first boss at the time, this psychiatrist, um, told me what fine, it's an, an acronym. Yeah, I can't say it on the webinar, but basically the acronym describes a not so fine state. So, but it's very interesting because if you listen for that, um, so what do you mean by fine? You know, um, so um, staying in a routine, um, admitting that you're not feeling great, connecting to others and talking about it, um, and then finding a way to give back because giving back always feels good. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, 
Chef Slicel, I'm going to come to you. Um, but I think this is also being underscored. I'm seeing some of the audience um, questions come in. And one of the chefs is saying um, that, that luckily for them, they work in healthcare and they're still employed, um, but that they've had to limit the hours of some of their staff um, who are now experiencing some mental distress from being at home and not having that paycheck coming in. Um, so I guess speaking to both of those questions, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think, you know, like um, Chef Dorfman said, we got to keep a routine and it's difficult when you're, you're subjected to being in your house. And then you have the dynamic, if you have your family, then you're even closer. So then you have the stress. And if you have a child attitude or children attitude and they're going to school, it's like, what do you do? How do you balance it? And as chefs, and I'm going to say this, we always are the ones that are doing something. We're the most flexible. We're always looking to do something to go above and beyond. Um, and I know that's something that how we're hardwired. But then all of a sudden it stops because this is happening right now, this global epidemic, this, this territory that we're uncharted territory right now. The biggest thing that I did, and I, we talked about it when we we're behind the scenes a little bit, is I got really frustrated yesterday and I, I told the panel, I was up from five o'clock the day before all the way up to 5.30 the next day trying to file unemployment, literally from 12 in the morning to 5.30 in the morning all I did was try to get in and I just noticed that I, my anxiety built up. I just started to feel those things that, the, you know, that I really didn't want to go that down that dark hole. It was that time period where I need, I knew that I needed to do something to change my view. And I asked myself the question, is everything going to be all right? What can I do to change myself? How am I going to be able to do this? Um, those questions and how myself answered those questions got me through it. I, it was a positive thing. Again, waking up, how do you, you know, change that whole personality? I woke up at nine. I didn't even realize that my, my daughter, I missed the, the, eight, the 10 o'clock class or the eight o'clock class. I had no idea, but I got up and said, okay, I'm just going to clean. You know, I've got stuff that projects I put off because I am working so much. I'm going to organize my kitchen. I'm going to clean my room. I'm going to, I've got down below to my right now, I have a pile of books that are all my recipes. I'm going to de 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 uh, construct all of those and put them into my, recipes so I can have hard copy and a digital copy. Um, I'm experimenting. I made the choice to, excuse me, to start a, a podcast and get out there and talk about top topics that are really here today. Talk to chefs about what they're feeling about COVID-19. Last week we did only female chefs because I want to really put the spotlight on what female chefs are going through as a whole uh, from get go. And I had from the gamut from Kimberly Brock Brown all the way down to Amelia who is, you know, just started out. Um, and I talked to them about it. So it kind of gave me that sense of that community self-worth that we're talking about how to get people involved because this is how we now have to act right now. We have to social distance ourselves. But for me, it was the mental thing. And there's one last thing I'll finish with my buddy, chef Art Letta who attempted to complete suicide uh, two years ago. He said, it's okay to be not okay. And I add to that. It's okay not to be okay. It's not okay to tell anyone you're oh, not okay. And you have to voice it no matter what. Thank you so much for that and for sharing. Um, Chef Saracen, I'm going to ask you the same question, but I'm also going to put another piece on that is, has come through um, from the viewing audience. So I'd love to hear more about um, your self-care um, and your recommendations, but also um, uh, someone from the viewing audience is saying, you know, that this is very helpful um, and that they're listening to what we say, but they're, they're feeling a lot of a pain about the future. And um, so I just wanted to put that out to the uh, panel as well. So please, Chef, if you could share. Sure. Um, so I'm going to give you kind of the three things that I'm, I'm kind of doing every single solitary day. Um, right before I get to that, um, the first thing I think to echo what many of the chefs have said here already is we need to have brutal vulnerability right now, especially in this industry. We're used to being conditioned to being tough and hard and, you know, just, you know, you burn yourself, you keep going, you cut yourself, you keep going. This isn't a burn or a cut. This is different. And so the first thing is having the ability to say, I'm feeling depression. And notice that I said feeling depression, not I am depressed. 
because these are two different things. A lot of times we associate ourselves with the feeling that's going on. For instance, we are not depression. We are not the condition in which we feel. We are that which observes the condition we feel. This is really, really important to understand. You're feeling pain right now, and that is 100% truthful. That is 100% valid. Guess what? I am too. I'm sure every chef on this panel is feeling that pain too. So number one, you're not alone. You're not alone. The second is know that you have to be able to reach out. So the three things that I do every day, number one, I spend 10 minutes at least just focusing on my breath, bare minimum. This world is chaotic. I am working around the clock, trying to do everything I can to support my business partners, to support the empire that we're trying to build. Um, and then with Industry United, it blew up. So I'm trying to take care of those people. But notice I'm taking care of everyone else except me. So 10 minutes a day has to start with me. It starts with focusing on my breath. The second thing I do, which I cannot stress enough, is journal. Journal does not need to be some mystical diary that no one ever reads. It can be as simple as taking a piece of paper or word processor, opening up a notepad in your phone. And if you have to swear every single solitary word, because that's all you can get out, that's okay. Because a lot of times when we go, if we're going on a great date or we're going on something, we look in the mirror and we make sure that our beard looks good, our hair looks good, our shirt looks good. Well, how do we do that from an emotional standpoint? We start by doing that by recording our thoughts. That's how we look in the mirror emotionally. And consistency builds the master there. So I, that's the second thing I do every day. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not so fun. Just know that. Third thing I do every single solitary day is I check in. I check in with three of the closest people in my world. And sometimes that's me saying, I don't know if I'm going to get through this. And that's the truth. That's the honesty. I don't know what that looks like. I know that I'm not giving up because that's not an option. We're chefs. We don't do that. We don't give up. But the having that, those three people in your life that you can just be brutally honest with, cry, yell, scream, that makes a world of difference. So start with those three things. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing. Chef Chris, I'm going to get to you in, in just one moment, but first I wanted to uh, welcome Chef Bacon. Um, I know he had a, an emergency that he had to handle, um, but we're glad that you're here with me. Chef, let me just read a few words uh, about you. Chef Bacon uh, is a certified executive chef and cookbook author from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Chef's current position is at Second Harvest Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina, overseeing the Providence family of programs. His program's culinary students work to provide meals to hungry children, seniors, and other individuals who struggle to provide nourishment for themselves and their families. Uh, after learning a wide variety of culinary and life skills, these students go on to employment in the greater community of the Triad of North Carolina. Jeff has received numerous awards and is a two-time recipient of the American Culinary Federation President's Medallion. Uh, he serves as a national member ambassador for Catalyst Kitchens and national job training cohort for Feeding America. Um, and Jeff believes in uh, his totality that he is fulfilling God's calling upon his life after a redemptive transformation of his own. So, um, Chef, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to start off, um, if you're comfortable, with you on the, the next question. And um, I'm wondering what changes uh, that you or uh, your chef colleagues have made today um, to improve your own mental wellness um, and those who are around you. Well, you know, it feels like everything is changing. And um, uh, as so many people have already mentioned that oftentimes we neglect the changes that are beneficial to ourselves and, and to our, um, our team's well-being. You know, we're, we're, we're so task oriented and um, that's definitely where I am right now. You know, we're reinventing our operation on the fly and dealing with all this uncertainty and um, you know, it's um, a lot of people are laid off and not working. We're working harder than ever. I, you know, I've shut down a catering company and two restaurants and retasked all those people to food production at the food bank. So we're putting out about 7,000 meals a day to kids and seniors. And we're also running a, um, a, uh, a displaced hospitality worker support location at one of our shutdown restaurants called Herd Collaborative Cafe. And we're feeding about 300 meals a day to people that have been laid off of restaurants and such. So it's really easy to forget to take care of ourselves when we're doing all of that, you know. And uh, I think the thing that we're learning three weeks into this is that we have a really supportive 
uh, community that we're a part of. We're lucky. I think the chef community is supportive anyway, but here in Winston-Salem, we, we really feel like we have something special. So a lot of those shining stars and really supportive people are showing up at herd and putting in their um, volunteer hours and helping feed the, the workers. And, and, and kind of almost by accident, there's a, a real healing atmosphere there. You know, we're able to bounce off the questions that's on everyone's mind, all the worries that everybody's feeling. We're getting to talk about that kind of together and openly. And that's, that's really helpful. Um, we are blessed that we have a social worker that has decided to volunteer their time with us and she's you know, primarily there to help people navigate the food stamps and the unemployment and all that kind of stuff and help them get hooked up with that. But she's also there to kind of um, have point people towards resources if they are struggling with um, some more serious emotional issues. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff on Facebook about, um, you know, you'll either come out of this a better cook or a severe alcoholic and and we're joking about that but when you're stuck at home and you're full of uncertainty you know a lot of people do you're sitting around you're eating and drinking you know all day and I, I certainly if I wasn't so busy I probably would be doing that myself um, so you know the, the 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 demon of substance abuse that plagues our industry anyway I think is even more prevalent and worrisome right now and that is something that we're trying to keep a real eye out for amongst the people that we have contact with. You know, if somebody goes missing or somebody doesn't show up, we're like, you know, why, why isn't that person here? You know, they were really enjoying contributing to this thing. And um, so there is definitely a collaborative effort to, to take care of people and take care of one another. I think the, the big concern I have is, you know, I know there's still gaps. I know that even though we've got this community set up, who are we missing? Who, who is, who's getting left behind. And that, that kind of keeps me up at night sometimes. But um, I, uh, I do worry, you know, the, the number one thing that we always say is that, you know, you gotta remember to take care of you first. If you, you can't help anybody if you're not all right. And um, I am trying to spend uh, some time every day, you know, really doing a check and say, you know, am I, am I, you know, cause I am, I'm going a million miles an hour. I'm working more hours than I normally do, which is already a lot of hours and with a whole bunch of uh, unique pressures. So I am definitely uh, having to, you know, check myself and, and ask other people, you know, how am I doing? You know, do you notice any danger signs? Um, and so far so good, but it is, you know, it's tricky. We as chefs suck at that. So, um, you know, I'm trying to, trying to be better, but I think we're learning, you know, the silver lining thing to all this is that we're learning lots of new skills and learning lots of new ways to do things. and working in conditions and situations and with people that we don't normally get to work with. So that part is um, good. I know we're going to come out with some innovative stuff at the end of this. Uh, we can't see it right now, but um, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the positives uh, when this is all back to the new normal. Right. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and, and Chef Curtis as well. I don't know if you wanted to um, specifically touch on, um, on, on self-care or if you'd like to move on to, um, another question, but we did just get an audience question in um, that was talking about how, you know, we're talking about using this time to enhance your future career um, and um, what might be some of your suggestions for those who find themselves out of work right now, but will be joining us back in the food service community in the future. Sure. I, I've talked to my team about this. We just did an exercise. I have nine on my team and we talked about what is the state of the industry and how is it affecting us? So we're not working. My first week, I was still getting up at 4 a.m., halfway in the bathroom, getting dressed. I'm in the kitchen at five and I've got the stove going, you know? So I had to, my own, just work through, work through that routine. And I'd come downstairs in my kitchen and start cooking. And all of a sudden I had a dozen, you know, chocolate, cupcakes and all this food and I'm here in the house by myself and I'm like well I can't even offer it to anyone so I had to get through that mental process of just kind of de-routining while I kept a routine um, because it was different and I was so out of my comfort zone I had to make sense of it science has proven also I, I was really tuning into how I was feeling in the morning because I was feeling pretty empty I'm in the kitchen with my team I run the whole cafe, my front of the house. 
So I had to deal with that. And then I went right into gratitude. And for me, that's prayer and gratitude because science has proven you can't be depressed and be grateful at the same time. You can't have a good feeling and a bad feeling at the same time, but we need to acknowledge what we're feeling and then take that up if we can. Physically, I'm um, quite active, you know, 12, 16 hours in the kitchen. So I brought my rebounder in from the garage, which is my workout area, which sometimes I come home at night, it's late and I'm not thinking about getting on my rebounder, which is like a mini trampoline. But I've brought it in right next to the area I'm working. So when I'm starting to get two in my head and I'm overthinking things and I'm getting overwhelmed, I just stop. I walk away from the computer. I won't walk away right now. Um, and I jump on the trampoline five minutes. But to the point of what can we do with our time, I've stayed, as everyone has said, connected to my team because I'm not used to not physically seeing them. And I've created to my benefit, I've been able to take us through trainings that I wouldn't have had time to do in the cafe, nor would I have been able to do it to the depth that I'm doing. So I've created assignments I used to teach culinary and marketing and sales. And I've really been able to learn more about my team than I ever knew by getting them to create a self-care plan that they would commit to. And we've done a 30 day thing. So we're like two and a half weeks in right now, but we're talking to each other and it's causing me to also say, okay, Nina, you hold so much responsibility for others, but make sure you're taking responsibility for yourself. And at the end of the day, I love getting in a tub with my essential oils. I'm an aromatherapist. I turn off the light. I light the candle and I get in my think tank. Mm -hmm. And that's where I can come up with whatever idea I want, no matter how crazy it is. And by the time I get out of the tub, which is about a 20 minute period that I just get in there, get quiet, breathe, relax in the dark. By the time I get out, I've got an answer to the problem I felt I stepped in the tub, into the tub with. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, we had an audience question um, that came in, Chef Schlissel, I'm not sure if you wanna take this one as well. Um, this is someone saying that they're, um, they're feeling very overwhelmed and alone. Um, and they feel like they have nowhere to turn and why would anyone want to help them anyway? Yeah, and that's the that's one of the things I actually wrote down is most people that are depressed or having some forms of mental illness They mm -hmm. feel like they can't get out. They feel the darkness But the reality of it is is there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is the light of warmth to be shine on um, Again, it would be one of those things that change your perception of what you're seeing and to do that is to change what you're doing. What it might be is you go to sleep, you close your blinds, you wake up, you open the blinds, uh, go out on a patio and have a cup of coffee, change the routine. We have a choice every single morning. We have the green, the blue pill, we have the red pill, the quote Morpheus. We can either stay in what we're doing and keep on going the dark rabbit hole of Alice in Wonderland, or we can change that attitude. The power is within us to do what we need to do. And that's the problem. Our minds are, they play so many tricks on us that we self-sabotage. And, you know, I'm probably the biggest self-sabotager ever, and I'm learning to change that. And we have to then say to ourselves, I, my routine was X. My new routine is now Y. Pick up the phone, call somebody, ask them how they're doing. You never realize that if you ask them, they might say something that might trigger something in you and say, oh my God, we're going through the same thing. I've got something in common with you. And that's the thing. We're always chefs, cooks, wherever. We're always looking to help the community because believe it or not, restaurants or whatever, where the eating establishment are, it's the soul of our community. We only know how to do is there's a time of need. We're the first ones to go out and help. Now it's us that need the help because we don't have restaurants opening. We've lost our jobs and we're sitting there thinking, what's the outcome gonna look on the other side? We don't have to worry about that now. What we have to worry about is our mental health and our attitude and changing what we perceive in the mirror. And it's all by us just saying, like Chef uh, Curtis said, it's really hard to think negative thoughts 
-hmm. if you're thinking positive and that's the key how to switch the positive and turn off the negative you know we all have demons and that's the real notion of what we have to do is how do we yell louder than the demon telling us what we're not doing right and that's over a period of time is shining light i mean look at chef keith over there he, he's got bright he's got natural light and it's really tough to be miserable when you have natural light i'm here in florida it's 88 degrees it's sunny it's 900 degrees humidity so i know i don't want to be outside i'd rather be in the ac because it's nice and comfortable but whatever whatever helps you think better and more positive thoughts then do it thank you very much and one of the other audience questions that came in um, is about eating well to feel well um, and specifically they were saying that um, they're eating a lot of carbs for comfort um, and um, they're wondering are there any specific foods that they may be able to or diet that they might be able to um, be following during this time uh, chef Dorfman I see you nodding your head so uh, I will I will let you take this one to start well, as, as Chef Schlissel was saying about, you know, the demons in your mind, I was thinking that it's, it could be a chemical thing, you know, so by changing your diet and your exercise, you change the chemicals in the brain, the chemicals in the brain, dopamine and serotonin also have an impact on your, you know, your microbiota, your intestinal mucosa. So those, you know, your, your gut is your brain, <laughs> your stomach is you know, your brain. And so uh, plant-based foods, omega-3 uh, rich foods, your fishes, your sardines, your tuna. I think they have sales on tuna right now and, and canned sardines. And, um, and although we're fortunate to live in Miami and Palm Beach, and um, it's critical that everybody get a little sunshine a day because there's a relationship with not getting enough vitamin D and feeling depressed. So I, I think that if you could at least control the, the chemical part, the diet part, the exercise part, we'll have at least more strength to, you know, duke it out with the demons in the mind. But, you know, I totally get it. I think we've all been in that, that dark place on how do you fight your way out, um, you know, eating well, exercising. Sleep part has been, you know, a, a rough thing. Um, I know for me, um, you know, I have a son that lives in New York and so, you know, and a daughter in San Francisco. So, you know, I have my concerns. We all have concerns that affect and impact our sleep, which affect our mood. And, um, but if we could control what we could control, then at least we're, you know, a step, a step closer. Sure. Absolutely. Um, Chef Curtis, any, anything you want to add? I know you're, you're my bodybuilding friend. So if there's anything, uh, Diet-wise, um, that you'd like to add as well. Yes, I uh, piggyback on Chef Dorfman with all of that. I think for me, I'll speak from experience. I rarely eat in the kitchen. Yes, I'm tasting, but I'll go till afternoon, and one of my chefs will say, "Chef, have you eaten?" You know, and I'll have to stop and go, "Oh no, I actually didn't." So now I'm at home, and I'm opening that refrigerator up. Like, what's in here? I, I'm just trying to use my time because I feel like. I need to do something. So at one point last week, I had to say, why are you eating that? Why are you eating that? You wouldn't normally be eating it in the kitchen. But what I'll add to that is, yeah, figure out what you're eating. Things like walnuts, dark chocolate. Those are going to give you more cognitive performance, better nutrients, as Chef said. Um, having berries, I've got blueberries and blackberries and raspberries in the refrigerator. I typically have these things already, but even as a plant-based person, vegan of 20 years, the other night I pulled out a um, vegan pizza that someone told me was really good. I never buy frozen food, but I did. I just grabbed it because all of a sudden it's like, is there going to be enough food? I better get things I can store in case we get in a hot spot and there's not even produce available. And I cooked that. I heated that pizza up and I ate the whole thing. I ate the whole thing and was still hungry. So I knew it was my mind going, but I was okay with it. I was like, okay, I ate it. There's a lot of carbs there, not the typical carbs that I would want to eat but I enjoyed it. I was grateful for it. And then I went on. We need to stay hydrated. Mm -hmm. 
I've got my water with lemon slices and lime in it. We need to drink our water. Watch the caffeine in the coffee. Maybe go from starting with coffee in the morning and trying green tea as you move into the afternoon because the L-thionine in that is helping the brain. It's helping you to relax in the brain. It does have caffeine, green tea, but it's also going to help you sleep better. So it's easy enough to Google foods that help you stay positive or you know fight even depression, just whole foods, whole foods, not a bottle of nutrients right now, just whole foods. You do want carbs. There's nothing wrong with carbs, but you want the right, right carbs the right protein, and the right minerals and vitamins. I mean, just to add to that, um, uh, so carbs is a, a, big, a big food group, right? Um, you could have sweets, and, and most people crave sweets when they're under stress, produces the serotonin in the brain, makes you feel really relaxed for five minutes, <laughs> um, and then you, you're driven to get some more carbs. What's important about getting the, the fruits and vegetables, even if you, you know, work on a farm once a week and help out the farmers, um, which I do you know, here in Miami, is that we get that fiber. And I think with all the sitting around the house, you know, our tummies are getting a little sluggish. So I think it's really important um, to make sure that that's also an, an important element of this and, you know, even if you're doing some fast food, whatever you're going through, get some fiber in your diet, some whole grains or a piece of fruit a day or, you know, bag of frozen veggies, whatever you could get in, because that's super important for, you know, managing your blood sugar and all that good stuff. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Chef Bacon, uh, I was wondering if you could assist with this question. We are getting a lot of questions from culinary students. Um, and I know that Chef Curtis and Chef Dorfman and I were um, addressing middle school and high school students earlier this afternoon. Um, they're, they're very afraid for their future. Um, they're wondering if there will be jobs for them in food service. Um, and um, they're just generally seeking any advice that they can get from more experienced chefs. So I was wondering if you might uh, kick us off with addressing the student chefs. I'd be happy to. It, that's a tough one because, um, you know, uh, us old crusty people have the benefit of uh, hindsight and experience. And I remember when I was young, um, every crisis seemed more acute and every, you know, uncertainty was scarier and, you know, it, it, it changes over time, but there is a lot of uncertainty in, in the industry right now. I mean, I know half a dozen people that I can think of on, on right off the top of my head who their entire life savings were in that walk-in in that storage room and in that bar that they've shut down and they probably aren't going to make it back. And, um, and so I know that students that are just starting out have got to be filled with trepidation for the future. But as anyone who's uh, had a little experience or even read about the stock market or in financial situations is that, you know, you have to take the long view and, and things like this that have this uh, immediate negative impact are often beneficial in the long run for industries um, because, um, you know, like the stock market needs a correction. Sometimes our industry needs a correction. And I think there's a lot of things that will happen as a result of this. Um, the obvious financial ones, you know, the, 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 the operators that maybe were underfinanced or maybe weren't the best operators in the world. Not that anybody deserves to go out of business, but you know, the ones that were weaker will probably not resurface, which will make ultimately in the long run, the, the industry stronger. But it will also, I think, have the benefit of having us that, you know, we get tunnel vision in this industry. I think it's just the nature of the business. You're, you've got your head down and you're, you're, you're in fire and heat. And uh, I think that people are having a time, a stop reset moment right now where we're getting to uh, count our blessings and appreciate stuff that maybe we didn't appreciate before. And I think that that will benefit the students because um, even though the, in the ACF, we take it for granted because we're so student focused and so education focused and we spend a lot of time saying, oh, this is our future and 
um, these students are the ones we got to nurture them and make sure they're great. But I don't know that the industry as a whole does that as well as the ACF does. And I think that there will be some more of that now. You know, you hear about the, the curmudgeonly chef who's like, ah, oh, I get these culinary students and they don't know anything. I got to teach them from scratch. And I think we'll, we'll appreciate the students more. And I think that there will be better jobs, maybe kinder jobs for them when this all gets back to the new normal. But, you know, in the short term, it's all going to be very uncertain and it's all going to be very scary. And I don't know how to make that go away without, you know, being dishonest and disingenuous um, because there's just uncertainty. I, I have a lot of uncertainty. You know, right now I'm super busy. I have a fly chasing me all around the room here, driving me nuts. But uh, um, I have a lot of uncertainty in my um, situation, even though I'm working faster than ever. So I think, you know, we need to encourage students to, to take the long view, to look at, you know, they're young, so it's easier for them. Oh, I think okay. she might have positive. Okay. Sorry, Chef, you froze for just a moment. Yep, yeah, sorry, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you um, for that. Um, one of the other questions that's come in um, is that um, someone is saying that they're afraid to express how they're feeling to anyone else. They don't want to be called crazy. They don't want to be end up on any um, uh, prescription medication um, or anything like that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to go around to whoever wants to take this um, question. And um, oh, okay, so uh, Chef, uh, did you want to start us off, Chef Slicewell? Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things that, I mean, I saw somebody ask the question, has anyone on the panel tried to hurt themselves? Mm -hmm. And I want to be upfront. This is one of the things I talk about. And this is, this is how I opened up the family mill last year. At the age of 18, um, my father said I would account for nothing and that I was going to be a loser, that I wasn't going to do anything. And at that point in time, I thought, well, maybe he's right. So I, I attempted my first and only time that I've attempted suicide. I realized that what my dad did is, in a, in a, it's mine what his father did to him. For me, this is now my calling, that I get to talk about what I went through. And I get choked up now, not because of what I did. It's because I've had nine people since I was 18 um, complete suicide. And the last one was my cousin two years ago. So, you know, the first thing I said was when I told my parents, I thought I was going to be locked in a straight jacket. I thought I was going to be on drugs. I thought I was going to do all these things because society dictates that men are men and we need to be virile and strong and we don't talk about our emotions. And that's no offense. That's just a bunch of B BS. The fact of the matter is two years ago when the ACF did it in the national convention and that we had that conversation I watched another chef break down because he was thinking about suicide. And it was between Susanna, Suzanne and myself and his wife was next to him. And it was just amazing to see him finally realize it's okay not to be okay. Um, the problem is, is that society dictates to us, we're not allowed to talk about it. And my ex-father-in-law completed suicide in 2003. And one side of my family was more morbid and asking questions about what he looked like in the body and so forth and so on. And the other side of my family was very hushed and I didn't know what was going on. I found out that my great uncle and my great grandmother both completed suicide. So again, society dictates that we don't talk about certain things and what we need to do here now and every day since moving forward is we all need to collectively say it's okay to not be okay and to talk about suicide. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Perfectly said, Jeff. <clears throat> We're all here for you. Um, I guess um, also, um, does anyone else on the panel have any um, anything that they'd like to add about um, uh, the thought of not wanting to talk to anyone and not wanting to open up. 
Um, yes, like uh, Chef Saracen. Yeah, I, um, first of all, what you just witnessed was raw and emotional and beautiful. Let's not forget that part of it, right? Like Chef just said it perfectly. We're in an industry where we, to show that level of emotion is not something that we're, we're, we're bred into, you know, it, it's tough it out. And to be honest, having done this my entire life in one way, shape or form, the strongest people are the people like chef right there who has the ability to articulate that there is not weakness in asking for help. There's strength in asking for help. And right now is the perfect time to be reaching out to people. Um, I think, you know, to, to kind of echo so much of what's been said already, we have to be asking for help right now because a lot of times we get identified with what we're feeling, right? Um, you know, the question in, in the chat that's coming in is like, you know, I don't want to be on medication. I don't want to be that. Well, here's, here's something you guys don't know about me. For the last two years, I've been in therapy. Two years. My mom passed away from terminal cancer just under two years ago. And I knew I was a primary caregiver. The level of depression, the level of anxiety, all that stuff that I felt, I knew that I wasn't able to handle that, run a company. I was writing my second book at that time. Like I was going through a breakup. Like these things were too much for me to bear. And so I had to ask for help. And in the last two years, I found more strength in asking for help um, than I ever would have found by trying to tough it out. Because where that would have led me, I probably wouldn't be here talking about it right now. And that's the reality of it. Thank you, Chef. Wow, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Chef Dorfman, did you want to uh, wrap us up on just that topic? Um, I mean, there's, there's a few thoughts. You know, you always think about you know, all the things we've all gone through in, in life. Um, we probably could, you know, have a, a three or four hour, you know, seminar about that. And I just think, like, just take a step. You know, the person um, that wrote in about just not, just feeling in a really dark place, just take one step, just get, get out of bed, sit on the side of the bed, take a shower, just take one step every day. You don't have to clean the house and do, you know, you don't have to do all these, you're not up to that. You know, we take baby steps. The other thing is when I spoke at ACF last summer, uh, chef, you know, the Facebook page Chef with Issues came up, but that's a support uh, system for those that need to anonym, uh, anonymously in our profession, um, you know, share. Um, and there's a lot of sharing that goes on there. And of course, there's switchboards and, you know, you know it's, um, suicide prevention hotlines and just verbalizing what you're feeling. And I think everybody has said that on on the panel, just, you know, it's like confession, you know, and you hear yourself say it and, and you just, you know, life is, is worth more than the way you're feeling at, at that moment. And there is help. There are counselors. Um, you know, there is the cognitive behavioral, you just, you know, sort of fake it till you make it, you exercise and eat, you know, and you hope everything sort of falls into place. And in the end, and um, and I and I wish and pray that for everybody who's who's here today, especially for the panelists who have shared. Thank you very much. And I know I'm 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 trying to look at the questions from the chat and also some that I'm getting on text and on Facebook. Um, but what all of that is spelling to me is that this has to be the beginning of the conversation. So I'm hoping that we can um, continue with this webinar series far past when we're in this crisis time, um, just to, to see um, us sharing and getting real um, and helping each other. Um, with that said, um, we are um, gonna go around then. I, I'd love for you to um, mention any sort of, uh, I, I don't wanna call them final words, but for this webinar, um, any of your final thoughts for this webinar for the food service community um, uh, and um, just anything else that you'd like to add to this conversation um, or suggest for future conversations. Um, so we will start it off then with um, Chef Bacon. Yay. So, yeah, I mean, mine will definitely be parting shots. You know, I, I am, uh, I 
I just got some horrible news. I, I was telling Michelle, I'm sorry I was late to the call. My my boss, our CEO of our company, was just diagnosed with COVID-19, and I'm I'm second in command here. So we had an emergency call to let folks know, you know, what um, is going to be the new reality of the new reality of the new reality. And so, you know, I'm I'm, I'm dealing with that, and and it's a lot. And um, what I I think my thoughts on on the overall thing that I would leave people with is, you know, this, this will make us better. This will make us stronger. I'm seeing already way more, as long as you stay away from the news, that this is bringing out the, the good in people. I see it everywhere. And you have to, if you're in a place where you're not seeing that, you have to change the place you're in where you do see that. Look at new things. Look at it from a different viewpoint because there's so much good going on right now. And, you know, more specific to our industry is that it's just... Uh, an undeniable reality that the world will always need us. Uh, chefs are not going anywhere. Uh, that's, I just texted Chef Hertz, who sent that question about what to tell the students. The, the world is always going to need us. Um, uh, unless everybody just starts cooking at home, which more of them will probably after this, but they still will always need us. Uh, our profession is not going anywhere. It is a noble and honorable and, uh, and love-filled profession. So just hang in there and it's all going to be okay. Thank you so much. And uh, Chef Curtis. Well, I think more people may be cooking at home, but they're probably not going to cook as well as we do. And we are a form of entertainment. I don't think we can forget that. We're not just sustenance. I think also for the students out there that are still wondering if there's going to be a career for them, there's not just restaurants, there's food styling, there's food photography. I work in the healthcare industry. There's always gonna be hospitals and those patients in the hospitals need to be fed. The associates that work in the hospitals need to be fed. I'm experiencing that right now. I think we're a resilient group. I think we need to learn to be more vulnerable and not really care so much if someone's gonna think we're crazy, let them. I've been called weird for a long time being a plant-based chef. And I was like, yes, 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 yes. I love it, I love it, I love it. I will continue to be weird. I will continue to not walk in the lane or not stand out because I love this industry so much. I love the future that's coming into it. And I think this time with all the pain we're feeling is going to show us an opportunity to come up out of the ashes stronger and show people what we're really made of. Thank you so much. And Chef Slissel. You know, it's funny that, you know, we, I talked about calling the pink elephant out in the room. I'm, I'm gonna call the pink elephant out again. This is something a little bit different. Our industry is going to change. The face is going to change, no matter what at the other end of this, the other side of it, what it's gonna look like, I have no idea, but I will say this, to especially the students that might be listening or whoever's watching this later on, we had some innovators back in the 90s that innovated molecular gastronomy to being this new craze in food. Recently, I just watched in Spain, there's a guy who has actually a 3D printer who's making plant-based steaks, mm -hmm. literally plant-based steaks out of a printer, and it cost about 30 bucks. To you, the students, to all of us as chefs, if you want to be different, if you want to have that different set of circumstances to differentiate yourself from the guy next to you. Now is the time that you can do this. Mm -hmm. um, you have to think outside the box and our industry is going to, we're not going to go anywhere because too many people don't like to cook and they want to eat out 134 million Americans eat out. How they're going to eat out is going to change, not what they're eating is going to change. And we have to be driven to be that change. And we look at that, be the change. We have to be the ones that set that tone. And the, now is more than ever, I think this is just a, a perfect opportunity to set ourselves up to be different, to showcase our way of thinking and to help farmers to connect to them so that, God forbid, I know here in South Florida, we had a farms that were mulling over a million pounds of green beans because they had no one to sell them to. So I really do think things are going to change for the better at the other end of this, whatever it might be. And I think the last thing I'll leave you with is just always, always remember you're only a phone call away from anyone to get the help you guys need and deserve. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Chef. And Chef Dorfman. You know, I, I, I think it's, it's all been said. I mean, you know, reach out and touch someone. That's, that's the most important thing. And, and the other thing is there are so many ways to deliver what we do. And I don't mean food delivery only. I mean, culinary coaching and counseling. You could do things online right now to guide people in their homes um, and provide that as a service or blog or work with companies who are looking to develop their recipe you know, portfolio. So there's lots of work out there right now. Um, it's just a matter of thinking outside, uh, outside the box. Um, but we, we should all have hope. I, I, people will not stop eating, that's for sure. The, they will always need us and they'll always need delicious food, right, Nina? Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thank you. And Chef Saracen, your final thoughts for the viewers. Well, uh, first and foremost, let's just be real. This industry is going to change, but this industry is so not over. So let's rejoice in that. Let's just take a moment to rejoice that this is gonna be back and you are gonna have a lot of people who are clamoring to go into restaurants and eat food again and support you guys. What you're seeing up here with this panel is little glimpses of light in a very dark world right now. And all we're required to do as human beings is to light up. It doesn't mean we have to show the entire path. It means we just need to have one little flicker of light and today, our deepest hope is that we can give you that one little glimmer of light and now we pass it to you. And it's your job to go light up this world as well because I promise we're gonna be back. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. Um, and thank you to all that um, joined in to watch this truly powerful panel discussion. Uh, please remember if you need urgent help, uh, the suicide prevention hotline, you can simply call 211 like calling 911, but 211 for um, if you need to talk to someone urgently and you're having those thoughts. Please follow the ACF uh, on Facebook and also on wearechefs.com for more news and information. We'll look forward to seeing you at one of our upcoming webinars. As I mentioned, this conversation will continue. Um, and on behalf of the ACF and ACF National Office, please be safe. We look forward to seeing you soon. And please remember, you are not alone. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you as well, Chef.